Hi, welcome everyone. So nice to see you home. I will take a few minutes if you want to take a seat, feel free. Hi everyone, you're just in the back. Great. So I am Sophie Ansivel, I'm the producing fellow here at Manhattan Theatre Club and I am really thrilled to welcome today Dr. Sue Grand. Welcome. Um, you have a little description about Dr. Sue's uh, bio in your programs, but I wanted to give a little bit more about what you do and what you've done so far, uh, if you don't mind. Thank you. Ah, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no problem. So, Dr. Sue Grand is a faculty and supervisor at the NYU postdoctoral program uh, in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, and she's also a faculty in the trauma program at the National Institute of uh, psychotherapies. Um, she's also a writer and editor, uh, among other books, um, the, Her the Hero in the Mirror, From Fear to Fortitude, and also Transgenerational Trauma uh, and the Others. Dr. Sue, welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I just want to say it's so moving for me to be here, what is it, eight years later? Yeah. Yeah. It's Eight amazing. years later, Eight and years. to see this incredible, beautiful cool. performance, and to see Eve so well and full of life, and it's such an honor to be here oh, after having witnessed what she went through. Yeah, yeah, it's it's lovely, and you're an integral part of the story. I mean, we hear your voice. Um, uh, for you all who've just seen the play, we hear uh, Sue's voice in the play, and that's. You can confirm that it's you. Oh yes, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> so we always start by asking this question um, to our guests, and I think it's even deeper for you. Um, what resonated for you today in the play? I know you've seen it before, you've seen it in the first uh, production in Boston at the NRT, <coughs> but what resonated to you? Oh, so much. Well, first of all, I just want to say that in Boston, which was, I guess, two years ago? Yes. Yeah, it was already a beautiful, moving, funny performance, and so Eve, and today it's even more beautiful and awesome and, and enriched by her. her it, the whole thing has grown even further, and the visuals were amazing. Uh, so, what, you know, what resonated for me? Well, what didn't resonate for me, but I try to pick something. You know, I do a lot of work with sexual abuse and trauma and women's bodies and a lot of work with, also, uh, it, with um, a lot of women who have not this kind of illness, which was life-threatening and severe and acute and definable, but various kinds of nebulous kinds of uh, physical ailments and have been falling through the cracks where they feel treated like hysterics. And the whole issue of how to approach the mind-body link and how to honor the story that's told through the body at the same time as not treating women like they're hysterics when they complain of symptoms that maybe a doctor can't exactly account for. Uh, so th the whole sense of healing having to be a mind-body experience in which we really humanize, we are humanized hopefully by our caregivers and really learn to listen to ourselves in ways that we never were taught to listen to ourselves. And I think that's a big part of what this performance is about. Definitely, definitely. There's that moment in the play where Eve talks about um, Dr. Handsome coming and, and telling her that he sees her and that he knows what he's done for women and that he will take care of her. Um, I guess, can you tell us more of that importance? Yesterday we had a, a guest for another of our talkback who was a, a primary um, care physician who was talking to us about the importance of listening to the whole narrative and listening to the whole story, the social um, history as well as the medical history of a patient. Can you tell us more about how important would that be, is that for, for a patient? Well, you know, probably the person who was here yesterday was talking about the field of narrative medicine and the philosophy of narrative medicine, which has to do with um, not just treating the patient like uh, a set of body parts, but treating the patient as a whole being, understanding the context in which this illness has occurred. 
And that means the entire context, the emotional context, the history. What does it mean to you? What does it feel like to you? What's it doing to your life? What might it teach you, which I think Eve really talks about, but also your whole social and political um, situation, the way that your social um, and political predicament have situated you so that, uh, first of all, it helps doctors understand the physiology to know all this, but it's also a way of grasping the whole person that you are. And often, when you're in the medical system, it, this horror story about Sloan Kettering, yeah. where he just plunges this excruciating thing into her chest uh, to relieve the pressure of the pus and the infection, and completely dehumanizes her as if she's a thing, doesn't seem to respond at all to her pain, or her terror, or her pleas, or her begging, and it's another rape. So one can be in a hospital and be regarded in a way that feels like a medical rape when you don't have someone humanizing and kind who tries to listen to the whole of you. Yeah. Definitely. Is it a work that you do with, with doctors or caregivers to, mm -hmm. to help them understand how important it is to have that whole history of a patient mm -hmm. before um, before starting to take care of their physical body, because that's, I guess, the mind yeah. and body connection mm -hmm. is as important as just the body part as your doctor. Right, well, I don't do that, but I would love to do that, to help train people in the medical um, realm to, first of all, walk around the table, look in your face, know your name, regard you as human, hold your hand, just those very simple, moments are so important. And I think that there is much more of a movement in medical school even to try to uh, awaken people uh, to that. But the rest of the training about neither, one of the things that's been very hard in psychology is um, this notion of somatization that she was talking about, that for a very long time, part of particularly regarding women uh, in a dismissive way as hysterics, if they had a physical symptom that didn't track what medicine clearly knew, and of course we know medicine, there's a whole lot it doesn't know. But if it was a woman, then what would happen is she would be regarded as somaticizing. The whole physiological aspect of it could be dismissed. Women could go and have heart attacks because they weren't being listened to. Definitely. Right, and they were regarded as somaticizing and sent to a shrink. And then unfortunately, there were a lot of people splitting the mind-body problem who would then uh, buy into the fact that this is somaticizing, that is, it, it's all in your mind, right? And just treat a patient like that for either edible anxieties or something like that, or their edible wishes or fantasies or conflicts. And meanwhile, a patient could be getting very, very sick. So the challenge of really integrating respectfully the mind and the body has been a slow-moving process, but it's much more um, recognized now. Definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Um, you, you've written a lot about trauma and, mm -hmm. and how the history of trauma, whether it's in your family or in the history of a, of a country of, mm -hmm. or what's happened before you, is impacting what happens to a right. person. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Especially you've talked about trauma just before in the sense of what I heard was in the sense of the Me Too movement where we mm -hmm. have a lot happening on the wake of what has happened to women before right. and women taking their strength right now. Mm -hmm. Can you check, tell us a little more about the impact of trauma and not dealing with the trauma today and, and, and trying to gain our power back? Yeah, basically. well, so you've just... Uh, condensed some big <coughs> questions. Um, one question that you're raising is the what we call the transgenerational transmission of trauma, which is the legacy of generations. Uh, for example, um, we have the illustration of the Congo. If you have generations that have been exposed to war and atrocity and rape, then there is with the best of intention, for example, in these mothers, right, who are having these children, the best of intentions to protect them and love them, and even if they can shelter them 
uh, very well. There is something left in the woman's biopsychological experience that in subtle ways gets transmitted to the next generation. And, and one of the things that we're trying to do in the trauma field is arrest that co continuing transmission through generations. And there's a lot of ways that that happens and there's a lot of ways that we can try to arrest it. And one of them is always knowing your own story and being able to listen to yourself. And one of the things that's going on right now is the Me Too movement, which is complex. Um, it's not fine-tuned. Uh, there are difficulties with it. Um, but what's happened is that women who have been really violated yeah. have finally felt the possibility to join together and to speak up and to speak up loud enough and publicly enough with each other that I'm hoping there's actually a culture shift. And there are real psychopaths who do these things, and I don't think they're going to um, start feeling guilty uh, or really revisit what they did. But I think that there could be a, a sort of a major culture shift in which certain things that were completely acceptable before, just things that good men realize they may have been involved with and they really feel remorse and change, and other men who are not so empathic and kind, but just realizing they can't do it. They'll get into trouble. And I think that kind of culture shift makes a big difference. And I, hopefully it will make a big difference, not only in stopping men from addressing women's bodies in ways that are disrespectful, but also really what we want is for men to get to know themselves in a very profound new way that, um, um, questions the culture of masculinity Definitely. and the way it's oppressing them too. So, yeah. And, and so I guess the next question is, what, what do we do? What, what, do women, what is helpful to women today to kind of take that power or that strength to come forward and learn about the right. industry? What, right. what would you advise them to do? Or what is well, you know, first of all, um, there's always a dilemma that an individual woman is having some difficulty in her life of some kind, and you can feel very alone, like it's just something wrong with you. And talking to other women and to your peers about their body experiences, we're not just talking about sexual uh, transgressions against you, but the whole predicament of women primarily being raised to be caregivers, and to subordinate the self and not to listen to themselves. I mean, when Eve wants to go to a hospital so badly, it's because she can surrender finally to being cared for and to just be with her own body and have a new beginning. So I really recommend that in general, that women and a lot of men who are, because you know, just because someone has a penis doesn't mean that he's not sharing this predicament. Um, in some way that you really start to take seriously whatever your mind-body system is telling you and try to learn to decode it and ask it questions and listen for its answers and be guided by it. And a lot of that takes place, you have to do that in your own way, but in dialogue with other women, with healers, with um, political and cultural movements. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in the play, Eve talks a lot about solidarity um, in her own words with City of Joy or mm. finding a sense of purpose mm -hmm. um, when she has the abscess and, and, and we see the gulf uh, spill oh, yeah. um, exactly at that same moment and, and her fighting kind of against her own body but also against uh, the oil spill at the same time. Right. Um, can you? Talk to us about the importance of, of that solidarity in, in, in fighting trauma and finding a sense of purpose. I think yeah. in the Hero in the Mirror, you write about that, about right. the finding that sense of purpose. Can you tell us a little bit? Well, so about first that? of all, I just want to say one of the things that's brilliant about Eve and never fails is that she has this incredible way of um, layering personal experience, political experience, um, uh, global catastrophes, the intimate, the personal with the rest of the world and the suffering of the world and of the earth, so that 
she really makes you feel the way these are all inseparable for each, from each other, and they really are. I mean, you can't listen to your own body signals, your own emotional signals. It's, it's a complete mirror of our inability to listen to the Earth's protest, and the protest is the same. We have these cataclysmic storms that are just like the kinds of emotional and physiological symptoms that we develop if for years and years and years we're not attending to our own signals. So, um, now, now I can't remember what the other part of the question is. Oh, about emission. Okay, so one of the things that I think, one of the problems that people have when they're you know, traumatized this way is that, well, two things. First of all, you can feel a deep sense of depression, impotence, and despair. You often feel very helpless and um, small and powerless and um, downtrodden inside. No matter how active you are, you have that part. So having a mission where you can get your hands on a project particularly, or a mission or something you care about, to make the world or someone better. Like I'm thinking about, who was the fart lady, Cindy? Cindy. Cindy. Don't we all love Cindy, yes. right? Uh, um, yeah. You know, so anything that you can do, particularly with others, so that you're not isolated, to make to you heal from the experience of feeling impotent and helpless and small, and that there are these big, massive, evil powers that you can't address. The other thing is that a lot of sexual trauma, this kind of thing, since we're generally raised in a culture which teaches women to feel it's their fault if they get raped. Their skirt was too short, they went out at night, they had a drink at a bar, they picked up a guy, they went to a fraternity party. So they, they absorb the shame and the sense of badness for their perpetrator. So the perpetrator may walk away feeling fine about what they did, right? They think you liked it or whatever, um, or you deserved it. The rape survivor goes away ashamed and full of a sense of their own badness. When we can lovingly give and see that our love is transformative to another, like Cindy doing her fart practice, right? <laughs> yeah. Every day we're transforming that experience of being bad inside into experiencing our own loving goodness, which of course was always there. But this kind of trauma and this cultural arrangement I mean, I'm not convinced that rape victims have to live afterwards, you know, that part of PTSD is living with a sense of shame and badness. But if you're in a culture that tells you it's your fault, then, we do. then how would you not? Um, thank you so much. We, we have time for a few questions. Um, if there are any questions in the house, anybody who would like to ask any questions? Right here. Yes. I have a question. The very last scene in which um, Eve takes her son, you know, um, to see the gorillas. <clears throat> and was that connection, I'm not sure that I fully understand it. You know, the human part of us, the animal part of us, the embracing, can you please explain? I, I, I guess the question, I'm just going to repeat the question. The question is, is the human connection with the animal connection in that last scene mm -hmm. where Eve takes her son uh, through the jungle uh, with the gorilla and, and if we can give maybe a little more detail about what that connection is about. Well, I can't, um, I can't say enough about that. I mean, one thing that you need to remember is the very beginning of this performance about a mother's body and a baby's body a mother holding a baby is the very beginning of being human. You're entered into the human existence, the existence that we share with all of the creatures, the kind of uh, sacredness of human and animal and plant existence. So part of this journey of Eve's in the performance, and you see the stuff about her mother and how cold and narcissistic her mother is when she, I can't believe Eve went to go care for her mother in this incredibly compassionate way when she herself was so sick. So you can see that there was no mothering. The, the last scene is a scene of great joy and great awe and comfort at how simple love is, how simple it really is to just 
enter each other into existence, to feeling holy and sacred because we're living beings. And the same goes for the gorillas. We shouldn't be annihilating their environments so that they can't, you know, that they're scarce. So, but that kind of reverence, that kind of love is so simple. It's just like a mother's embrace of a baby. And we've made it so complicated. Thank you. Any other question? There is a question right here, and then I'll come to you. So when Eve was doing a talk back, uh, someone asked her how she copes with all the traumatic stories she's heard. And since you work with trauma and women who've been abused, how do you cope with it? And all of the bad things happening in the world, what does <coughs> Sue do? Well, the, what does Sue do? So right now, Sue has a chronic severe case of reflux because of what's going on, particularly with Trump. Ever, si ever since the election, Sue is not feeling so hot myself. Um, so, um, you know, it, it enters you and it affects your, um, you know, it affects your dreams, it affects your sleep, it affects your fatigue levels, it affects your body. Um, but it also, it is so, at the same time, and I think that this is very important, this is part of having this kind of mission, is that it is so awesome. You know, the way Eve is describing the women in the Congo with their incredible life force after what they've been through, right? This is what I see in my patients every day. I cannot believe the things my patients have suffered and the lives they've built and their kindness and their heart. And this is the antidote to just taking in this uh, totally um, disturbing dark experience of listening to all these stories. And then there's, there are moments like Eve's experience, I think, with Angeli Angelique? With Angelique. And Telling the story of Angelique at the end. Yes. I mean, when, but what she's saying is that story, entering that story for her is when she decided she should die, mm -hmm. way before she knew she had cancer. So, you know, the other thing is we need to take care of ourselves. We need to know when it's too much. I need to know when to turn off MSNBC at night. Yeah. And, and I, what I've been doing is I've been watching reruns of Seinfeld. <laughs> every, I started at the very beginning, and I've been watching every single one, and I do that instead of watching MSNBC at night after I've seen patients. I'll only turn it on MSNBC on when I think Mueller has issued an indictment. So what I encourage everybody to do is, again, listen to their own signals and figure out where you're past your threshold and when you need self-care. I think we have time for one last question. I see a few hands raised. Uh, I'll go right here. Hi. Um, I have a question regarding um, the gap in the medical community in professionals who are specialized in treating trauma, mm -hmm. in particular in families that experience domestic violence or child abuse, and what can we do to address that? Because, um, Wait, you know, are you, you by gap, do you mean that there aren't enough people? There aren't enough people, mm -hmm. and, and um, I mean, they, they may be special. First of all, they're not enough for just the trauma in general, but then <coughs> yeah. specifically domestic violence and its intersection with child abuse, and, and there's just nobody, you know, to serve. Right. Right. The, the question is, what do we do? What can we do? The, the question is, how do we address the gap in the medical profession uh, with caregivers who deal with trauma, uh, especially in, in, in um, domestic violence, domestic violence um, issues, and how do, we, how do we address that gap? Well, bless you. <laughs> um, so, first of all, there are a million gaps like this in terms of people's need for people, you know, people in poverty. I mean, the gaps are horrific and, of course, not getting any better right now. Um, but there's a couple of things. One of them is raising the level of collective consciousness, just like the Me Too movement is right now. And we need it with domestic violence, and we need it with health care and people's impoverishment so that it's in the cultural register as a collective consciousness that these are terrible things that are happening to people not infrequently, right? So um, these kinds of movements that raise consciousness make put pressure on systems, on they, they get more philanthropy, they're, you know, you look at the Time's Up movement, right? So, and it puts pressure on our government 
to start providing more. Uh, and that's, that's all I can say at the moment, because we have so little provision. I'll take the last question right here. Yes, uh, it appears that uh, Eve's remarkable sense of humor has been a tool for her throughout her life. I'm curious at what point in her recovery she wrote this. So the question is at what point in her recovery um, Eve started writing the play, right? Yes. I don't know. <laughs> you must know. Uh, I don't know the exact answer. I know that uh, the play um, is issued from her memoir. So she wrote about her history first as a memoir and then uh, the play started from that. Um, so that's all I can say about that. And that's all. Had she healed when she wrote her? She I can't answer that. Uh -huh. I, can't I do know she that. always had a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Anybody had one more question? Yeah, I have a question. Oh, there's one in the back. I'll, I'll go to the back and then we'll be it. Okay. Yeah, talking about transmission, generation and transmission of trauma, um, I thought it was profound, by the way. On all level, I can't even comment about it. I think that I can take a whole week on each piece. And <laughs> but I thought that there might have been, I was interested and curious a little bit to hear a little bit her mother's background mm -hmm. in order mm -hmm. to understand that what did she experience actually that was transmitted as we said narcissistic or coldness or, or so forth. There is something in the mother's background that we are not aware that is transmitted through the generation. I was kind of thinking even that it might be that the looking into Congo and into genocide is not incidental. Mm -hmm. That there was some, maybe there is more to the story, and I'm just leaving it as an open question because we are talking also about generational yeah. transmission of trauma. Mm -hmm. and, and remember that her mother is a woman too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So that last question was about um, what was Eve's mother's story <coughs> that could inform and help understand what Eve's story has been. <coughs> So I don't know, and I don't know if Eve knows what her story is, but I think the idea of discovering at some point what your family's stories are really makes you understand and, and make links and heal yourself in ways that are really extraordinary. And to so many of us, we only get curious often after our parents are gone, um, but it's a wonderful thing to find out. One of the things that goes on with the transgenerational transmission of trauma is there's a lot of history of broken and damaged attachments, violated attachments, murders, um, immigration, separation, all kinds of things. And one of the ways that we carry this trauma forward is by not being able to bond, by being afraid to bond, by not knowing how. So I don't know what happened there, but we could certainly see that inability. Yeah. So, so I wanted to remind all of you that this series is possible by the generous uh, help of Jan Warner, who is uh, helping this series in the memory of Arthur Warner, her husband. I also want to remind you that um, if you go to the website, you will see all the other uh, Beyond the Stage talkbacks that we have after the performances. And feel free to come back if there is a, a guest speaker that you would like to hear or listen to, feel free to come back to the talk back and we'll be happy to let you back in uh, to this, the uh, following talk backs. Um, thank you so uh, much. I students. just want to say what an honor it is to be here, to have this opportunity. Uh -huh.